this group uh, is really a, a collection of four orders, the Insectivora, uh, the Macroskeletae, the Scandentia, and the Dermopterans. Uh, the reason we cover them together uh, is not based on diet or anything of that sort. Uh, instead, it's based on this generalized uh, morphology. Uh, they have a morphology that is um, akin to what we think would have been the first um, eutheria in mammals. Uh, that is uh, sort of a generalized body plan adapted to uh, arboreality. Um, and features of the skull that uh, seem to be more plesiomorphic or, or more basic, more basal. Um, so there is not a strict uh, phylogenetic, close phylogenetic relationship amongst them. Uh, instead, we're putting them together because of their basic uh, eutherian morphology. Um, <clears throat> So let's begin uh, looking at the Insectivora. Uh, remember there are four orders, uh, and the first order we're going to look at are the Insectivora. Uh, these include the Aranaceids, uh, those are the hedgehogs and the gymnores, uh, the Tenrex, which are the Tenrex and the Otter Shrews, uh, the Sericidae, which are the Shrews, uh, the Chrysochloridae, which are the Golden Moles, uh, the Selenodontidae, which are the Selenodons, and then the Talpidae, which are the moles um, and the desmonds. Uh, morphologically, they appear to be less derived than other mammals, uh, and that, again, is probably because of their plesiomorphic condition. They are, um, they are more basal. They are essentially the root from which all of the other modern mammals have evolved. Um, they tend to be small, uh, pentadactyl, plantigrade locomotion. We covered all of that. We talked about the difference in hair, uh, the fact they have only guard hair, uh, the reduced or absent pinnae, um, and then a small uh, brain case um, with smooth cerebral hemispheres. Uh, we talked about the absence of auditory bullae, um, the fact that testes are abdominal, or if they're abdominal, they're very marsupial-like and that the scrotum is anterior to the penis. Uh, some have a cloaca, uh, and the jugal, importantly, is reduced or absent. Okay, um, here's a nice example of Blurina brevicata. Uh, you can see the absence of the auditory bullae replaced instead or substituted instead by the um, uh, tympanic bone. Uh, the absence of the jugal, so there is no zygomatic arch. And of course, the other thing to note is the dentition. It's this nice uh, dilambdodont dentition. Um, da -da 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 -da. Uh, the dental formula is plesiomorphic, so a total of 44 teeth. Um, and notice that the number of incisors is different from what you get in marsupials. In marsupials, if they are um, uh, uh, polyprotodont, then they have more than the three upper and three lower uh, incisors. Uh, but here you can see the um, what the tooth rows look like in a talpa and potamigale. Um, so you have both the, um, the zelamdodont and dilamdodont dentitions there. Uh, Cryptotus parva, that's another uh, shrew that we have here in North America. Uh, in Missouri, actually, uh, this is the least true, and it is the smallest mammal in North America, uh, excluding some of the bats. So it's the smallest terrestrial mammal. Um, we can skip all of that. Uh, we did make a big point about talking, or we did make a point about the shape of the skull. Um, and this is true for all of the insectivores. The If you look at the, the line that's uh, formed by the top of the skull and the bottom of the dentroid bone. Those two lines appear to be parallel. Uh, so it's almost as though the skulls are um, this nice sort of tubular shape. Uh, we talked a little bit about the mechanics of uh, why that might be uh, and the fact that these animals are probably emphasizing speed ratio rather than mechanical advantage. Um, we talked a little bit about hedgehogs. Uh, so these are the Aranaceids. We talked about the the uh, fact that the spines do not, um, do not harden until after birth. Um, these are old world mammals, so they are in Eurasia and Africa. 
Um, the hedgehogs that you find in pet stores are the Ethiopian hedgehogs. Um, so they are omnivorous. Uh, they'll eat anything. They'll eat uh, insects, invertebrates, eggs, fruit, carrion. They'll eat the garbage that you put out in your uh, compost pile. Uh, so there again, you can see the shape of the skull, the sort of parallel uh, kind of top and bottom of the skull. Uh, do look at the teeth. Notice that the teeth are, um, there's this hint of the stylam that on uh, structure there, but the teeth are more rounded like yours. So these animals have a diet which is more uh, closely uh, associated with omnivory, so more like your teeth. Uh, primate teeth, human primate teeth at least, are designed for uh, eating anything and everything, uh, just like a raccoon, unlike a cat or a dog or something like that. Okay, uh, we talked a little bit about their defensive postures, we talked about self-anointing, um, and we also talked about the fact that uh, the European hedgehog is the uh, only insectivore capable of hibernation. Uh, others can go into estivation or torpor, but that's different from hibernation. Remember, hibernation is when you uh, allow your body temperature to drop all the way to 4 degrees centigrade and then bring it up from there. Okay, uh, we talked a little bit about gymnures and the fact that they don't have spines, the fact that they are associated with wetlands. Um, and these, uh, it's, it's an interesting group and I would invite you to read more about gymnures. Uh, the talpids are the, um, uh, the moles. Um, they're fossorial and as a consequence they have uh, a morphology which is geared towards swimming through dirt. Uh, so they have a fusiform body, uh, pinnae are reduced or absent, small eyes, and a keeled sternum. Uh, we talked about the pectoral girdle. Um, we talked about the fact that the sternum is keeled. You see that in the upper illustration. And the fact that when you look, uh, pay attention to two things. Number one, the humerus. Uh, look at the trochanters and the deltoid ridge and uh, all of that. Notice how robust that humerus is. Uh, so the muscle uh, insertions that are taking place on that humerus uh, the surface area is quite large, meaning that it can support a large muscle. The power that's being uh, exerted, the forces exerted on that humerus are extreme, uh, so it has to be designed to tolerate those forces. Uh, notice, too, the olecranon process on the back of the ulna, how large that is. Uh, so these guys have a large mechanical advantage associated with that forearm. Uh, and you can look at the hand itself. Notice how uh, it's shaped like a spade, and it has this accessory structure on the on the bottom here, which is all about increasing the surface area of the hand um, and making it possible for these guys to dig. So it's as though their hands are really spades, and they're using those to dig through the ground. Uh, so when they're digging, they're moving those appendages to the side, which is different from what the chords do. Uh, they move the dirt underneath them. Uh, and here again, you can uh, see with some of the uh, musculature that's associated with that. So uh, not only the limb musculature, but also uh, the shoulder musculature is quite extensive. Uh, here's the skull of Scalopus aquaticus. These are insectivores. They're not eating the, the bulbs of your tulips or anything of that sort. Uh, they're perfectly harmless out in your lawn. Uh, if you've got them, good for you. All right, uh, just one quick uh, point. We did make a statement about Scalopus aquaticus and why it's called aquaticus, because it isn't aquatic. Uh, recall that uh, it was named by uh, Linnaeus, uh, and when Linnaeus saw the first specimen, he saw the large hands, he just assumed that those would be like paddles for moving through the water, and that made sense. Uh, because the description for where the first specimen came from uh, was along a stream bank, so he made the reasonable assumption that these animals would have been aquatic, and of course they're not. All right, um, let's uh, continue on. Uh, Desmonds are uh, strictly old world. Um, da -da -da -da. The tenrex, we talked at some length about the tenrex. Uh, these guys are restricted to Madagascar, which is unfortunate because obviously the amount of environmental degradation in Madagascar is extreme. 
Uh, it's not the fault of the people that live there. They are in extreme poverty um, and they are doing, doing subsistence agriculture and that means a lot of slash and burn agriculture. Um, but uh, the important thing for us uh, when it comes to the Tenrex is the amount of morphological diversity that you see in that group uh, resembles almost everything that we're looking at um, today. So they have forms everything from hedgehogs to moles, uh, shrews and muskrats. So there's an extreme amount of morphological diversity in the group. Uh, and there you can see a skull of, um, of a Tenrex. Notice again that the, the absence of the jugal all right, um, the chrysochlorids, those are the golden moles, and the reason they're called that is because their fur is iridescent. Uh, if you ever get the chance to see one in a collection, um, just hold it up and turn it in the light, and uh, you'll see just the bizarre colors that emerge from that, uh, from that uh, pelage. Um, it's hard to imagine that it has any adaptive significance, um, but it is kind of cool to look at. All right, um, da -da -da -da. Uh, we talked about all of those guys. Uh, the Selenodonts, um, there are two species. One is Cuban uh, and the other is in Haiti in the Dominican Republic. And of course, that's not good news because of obviously the extreme poverty and, uh, and um, lack of access, the extreme poverty in Haiti and then lack of access to uh, Cuba. So. We really don't have a very good sense of what the current status of these animals are, but they uh, they can become quite large. Uh, so total length on the Cuban Selenodon, at least, is a total length of 600 millimeters. So that's that's quite a large animal. All right, and there you can see what the uh, again notice the absence of the jugal. And and notice the uh, notice the groove on on the canine there. So uh, an ability to deliver um, a toxin. All right, uh, some speculation about whether they can echolocate or not. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Okay, um, the Sericids, uh, that is a huge group, uh, 23 genera and 312 species, so it's very, very diverse. Uh, they range in size from 3 grams all the way up to 100. Uh, the three grams would be um, Cryptotus parva, which is our uh, least true. Uh, so these are the, uh, they're divided into two subfamilies. Uh, the Sericinae, which are the red-toothed shrews, and the Crocidurinae, um, which are the white-toothed shrews. Uh, the red-toothed, the red on the teeth of these guys is a consequence of iron. Uh, and of course, the advantage of that is that uh, the teeth don't erode. Um, as rapidly uh, when they're breaking through the hard exoskeletons of invertebrates. And notice that the Sericids or the Sericinae are located in the Nearctic, uh, and then the um, Crocidurans are in the Ethiopian region, so they are uh, African. Uh, so there's Blorina brevicata. Uh, we have Blorina brevicata in the northern part of the state, Blorina um, carolinensis, where we are here in southeast Missouri, and then uh, Blorina uh, hylophaga is uh, just to the west and south of us, but they all have these red teeth. There's Crocidura, and you notice that the teeth are white, so this is in the Crocidura nae, so it's the other subfamily. Okay, um, let's skip through all of that. Um, notice the, uh, the dilambdodont dentition. Okay, let's skip through all of that. Um, skip through all of that. Um, we did talk about uh, caravanning, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, we did talk about the fact that they don't live very long uh, and the fact that they die. It's very hard to keep these guys in captivity uh, just because feeding them is such a, a difficult challenge. Um, we did talk about the relationship between uh, length of life and body mass. The bigger you are uh, on this log scale, the longer your life is expected to be. Um, obviously, if you are morbidly obese, so just getting fat isn't going to make you live longer, it's going to make you live shorter. Um, but um, across, uh, across all mammals, um, the bigger you are, the longer you live. There are a couple of exceptions. Uh, gliding mammals are an exception, and there are a few others as well. Um, but you notice that uh, because these guys are so small, obviously they have very short, uh, very short life expectancies. 
Okay, the macroskeleds, uh, these are the elephant shrews, uh, four genera and 15 species. They are strictly African. Uh, I do have a, a, um, uh, a little video clip. Uh, it's on the web page, so take a look at that. It's very short, and it just gives you an, it shows you an example of, a, of an elephant shrew at the Helsinki Zoo in Finland, uh, which is kind of cool. So they look almost like, uh, like a cross between an elephant and a kangaroo rat. Um, they are bizarre animals. Um, so there's the, the basic morphology of these guys. Uh, look at the little uh, video clip. It's kind of cool. All right, so size ranges from 50 to 400 grams. That's fine. Uh, hind limb dominance, that's the standard um, thing. Um, da -da 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 -da. Let's skip past all of this stuff right here. Oh, uh, one other thing. Notice that in some of these animals, just like in marsupials, you have all of these... Uh, additional vacuities in the in the hard palate. So once we get past uh, the dermopterans, so the insectivores and the dermopterans, that feature goes away. So this is another one of those characters that ties them in closely to sort of the, uh, the basal eutherian mode. Um, so the scandentia then are the tupiads. Uh, these are uh, the tree shrews. There's only the one family. It, the two I's in the name, uh, that should be pronounced Tupaiidae, um, but everybody just refers to them as the Tupaiids. Uh, so two I's together, it's, uh, you have to inflect that E sound in the, in the Latin name. Um, so they uh, have, and they still are by many people, considered to be basal primates. Um, may or may not be true, but they have a very squirrel-like body. Um, they look kind of like a... a um, cross between a squirrel and a, and a shrew. Uh, they are reasonably large. They're restricted to um, uh, Southeast Asia, the Philippines, and all of that. Okay, um, let's skip past all of this. And then uh, finally the Dermopterans, which are the flying lemurs or the Kalugos. Um, I will try and put up a, a short video clip of, of Kalugos. Um, they are, uh, they are amazing animals. Uh, it's one of the uh, many um, adaptations of, of mammals to gliding. So one of the independent ev evolutionary events that led to gliding within mammals happened about six or seven times, maybe as many as eight times, and this is one of those. Uh, the reason they're so interesting is uh, because they're um, somehow viewed to be on that basic pr basal primate kind of a lineage. And uh, here they are, uh, they're gliding. There's a group of primates, uh, the paramomyids, which are all extinct now, which were also um, gliding. So there were gliding primates. So these guys are thought to be on kind of that lineage. And they're also interesting because people think that uh, this might represent the evolutionary origin uh, for the evolution of bats, which is the group that we'll be talking about next. Uh, so uh, James Dale Smith has this very nice illustration of how you get from a Dermopteran-like form uh, to this extension of the fingers, this webbing between the fingers, and then this gliding locomotion, this top-down hypothesis. Uh, more about that when we talk about bats. Uh, there's just the one family, the Sinocephalidae. Um, there's one genus, Sinocephalus, and then there are two species. Um, one interesting thing uh, to notice when you look at these guys um, is that um, they are arboreal folivores and they, their teeth are um, very specialized. So the teeth are pectinate. Uh, there you can see it in the diagram, uh, the second uh, illustration from the left, uh, those comb-shaped lower incisors. And that's so that they can... Uh, scrape the waxy cuticle off the surface of the leaf uh, and then get at the stuff that's down below. Uh, so as arboreal folivores, uh, they're pretty specialized. Uh, they eat only the emergent leaves, the freshly emergent, fresh green vegetation from a few species of trees. Um, and those are obviously not distributed continuously throughout the forest. So these guys are covering large distances uh, to get at that food resource. So and that is something that turns out to be true for all gliding mammals. They all have sort of a specialized diet. Uh, so the idea is that gliding 
enables these animals to cover large areas in a relatively short period of time and consequently treat a coarse-grained environment in a fine-grained fashion. Okay, and there you can see an example of what those pectinate teeth look like. Uh, this is a specimen from the Field Museum. And there uh, you see the, uh, the bottom of the skull. So it, it looks very different from uh, the teeth that you saw on, on uh, some of the other guys. But you notice that uh, basic tribosphenic sort of tooth, that nice triangular uh, kind of tooth. Uh, we'll be talking more about, um, about tooth morphology a little bit later in the semester. Okay, um, that's it. Uh, I don't know how long this took me. I hope it was less than 15 minutes. We'll see. All right, talk to you guys next time.